morning, everybody, and welcome to our service on this rather warm day. I hope your welcome has been warm too, and you will feel the warmth of our fellowship. We welcome people from Texas, from Oklahoma, from East London, and in the balcony, the choir, the band, and their friends from Utah, all 320 plus minus one or two of you. You are all most welcome, and particularly your director, with your director, Larry Smith. We welcome you. So we will hear your introit first, and then without further announcement, we will sing our first hymn, 443, come let us sing of a wonderful love. lift up our voices as we sing, come let us sing of a wonderful love.
to say sorry and then we shall gather all together as we say a song of Christ's glory which you can find at 797 in the hymn book so if you could find that now please 797 we have just sung about the wonderful love of God reaching out to each of us seeking us out even when we do not respond heavenly father we thank you for this love an unconditional love reaching out to us we thank you that even when we have turned away from you you have not turned away from us we thank you that when we repent of our past misdeeds you are willing to wipe the slate clean give us a fresh start free from shame free from guilt loving father you have set us in communities of love and concern our families our friends and our church family help us never to take those close to us for granted Help us to give thanks for those with a concern for us, mediating your love to us. On this summer's day, sunny and bright, with music in the air from our choir and our congregational singing, we thank you for the love and hope and joy at the heart of our worship. Accept our songs of praise as our heartfelt thanksgiving. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have just said thank you, yet how rarely we do so in the course of our daily lives. We are so often people of complaint, people speaking of others in negative terms, people bemoaning our lot bringing a dismal, not a joyful tone to conversations. Lord, your kingdom is full of promise. Promise not always visible, but always held out to us as promise. Help us, Lord, to become kingdom people, always looking for glimpses of your future glory. We are sorry that we allow circumstances in our individual lives and the circumstances of our communal and national lives to fill us with despair. As Christians, we are called to be people of hope, responding to situations of need with help, responding to people in sorrow with love and care responding to cynicism and skepticism all around us and especially in the political world with the values of the kingdom and our faith in human beings lord if we are tempted to be in despair turn us around fill us again with your grace and your promise of abundant life abundant life for all and the promise of your coming kingdom. These prayers we bring in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we turn to a song of Christ's glory. Christ Jesus was in the form of God. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Being found in human form, he humbled himself. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And so we hear our choir again singing, If You Love Me.
it's summertime and we're still in that period of ever-changing Sunday school. I had hoped to be able to tell you that this week we were running completely, um, but sadly leader illness means that's not the case and we pray for those leaders and hope they recover soon. Some of St. Catherine's is what is going ahead. It's fresh. So those in preschool, naught to about five, you are very welcome to stay up here or you can go downstairs to the creche where there'll be leaders for you. Junior church is also running, will be next door. And that's for those in, who've just finished reception to year eight. The junior church will be running next door. Sadly, once again, it's the youth group that can't meet today. And so those in year nine to 13, we ask you please to stay in service. Hopefully soon we'll have this back to normal. I'm very grateful to those who have volunteered. We're still in need of a lot more volunteers. Please keep thinking and praying. But before we go, shall we pray together? Let's pray. Lord God, we ask that you will bless those of us leaving this main service as we learn in different ways but ask that you also bless those listening to the sermon and the rest of the service in here. May we all hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. So we'll now hear our reading for today. There's only one reading from Corinthians, read to us by Gloria. The scripture passage today is taken from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, reading from chapter 5, verse 11, to chapter 6, verse 2. Let us hear the word. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others that we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, <coughs> it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves but for him who died and was raised for them. <clears throat> from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal to us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, 
we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on the day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. This is the word of the Lord. And so we sing again the hymn of Charles Wesley, 498, God of all power and truth and grace. It's only when someone climbs this mountain, by the way, this pulpit has an oxygen cylinder halfway up to help the preacher get to the top, but it's only when we get here that we see all that lies ahead of us, like Moses from Mount Nebo looking into the promised land. And only when the preacher who has previously sat there has a chance to see what produced that lovely singing up there above his head out of sight. So it's really lovely to see you all this morning and to hear you. It's uh, Utah, it's not a state I've ever been to, and uh, I looked up one or two facts about it. It occurs to me that we've been receiving these groups from the United States for so long that we might just as well get a state flag from each of the states <laughs> and add them to what we've got. But uh, the 
state flag for Utah is a curious one. It's got a beehive in it. I've never known anybody have a beehive on a flag before. And it's something to do with some uh, translation of a sacred script, I believe. And it leads to the watchword for the state of Utah being industry. Well, now there's a good Protestant concept, that is, industry. <laughs> and if I may say so on this very hot morning, not one of you looks very industrious. <laughs> Never mind. We're here to do some work now, and you better get ready for it. Uh, but I've been also looking at all the states that abut onto the state of Utah. So many of them. You're in the middle of everything. Um, except that there's only three million of you altogether. And you're now in a city that is more than three times as big as that in terms of its population. And your state was uh, established or incorporated in 1896, while the house I've just left um, was built in 1891. So you're all kind of newcomers. <laughs> and all the more welcome for that. I'm in the last few weeks of my ministry here, and I'm trying to pull forward a few themes that um, have mattered to me over the years, and I've done that this morning. Uh, some of you regulars might, in coming here this morning, have noticed outside the manse the detritus that is currently gathering there. What a load of rubbish, ugly stuff indeed. Yet just five days ago, we were waking up in a room carpeted with some of that mess, taking our shower in a bath that now lies ignominiously on top of the pile. All this has happened in the twinkling of an eye, in the immediate aftermath of our house move. So after 21 years of living on site, we've taken our first step towards our retirement. We're now living in Croydon. And you good folk from Utah won't have a clue about it, but we've lived in London for such a long time, but London for us is north of the river, and south of the river is foreign territory. <laughs> and the passport office are very, being very slow in issuing us our new passports. <laughs> so we are even living illicitly in that foreign country south of the river. And I've driven in from there this morning. We've done well in the last four days, I want to report. Our pictures are on the walls. I'm saying this, by the way, in case a thousand people queue up to ask me the question that will yield these answers once and for all. That's it. Our pictures are on the walls. The fridge works. We haven't got any curtains and therefore have to undress in a room that isn't overlooked by the road and the neighbors. Yet we do have, for the first time in decades, a lawnmower. I was driving home yesterday from Wesley's Chapel with the lawnmower in the passenger seat of my car <laughs> and listening to the news on the radio. And two items struck me. Two events speaking utterly different languages. Firstly, I heard that the Church of England has set up a group to study what to do with same-sex marriages, a study likely to take three years. Critics spoke of sending the matter into the long grass. My lawnmower nodded in agreement. <laughs> and then there were the reports from the Gay Pride March through the center of London. A buoyant Muslim mayor gave it an enthusiastic send-off. The band of the Welsh Guards played marching music at the head of the procession. Gay and lesbian members of the emergency services were particularly present. The 50th anniversary of the decriminalization of homosexual people was being celebrated in style. No long grass here. Once again, my lawnmower gave its silent assent. Now, I begin my sermon with these matters, not because I want to discuss the question of human sexuality, not this morning at any rate, next week perhaps, but rather because once again it brings into the public arena, and it was on the news this morning for the whole nation to hear it, the question of how we interpret the Bible. People on the conservative side of the argument allege that some of the rest of us are playing fast and loose with the Bible, with biblical teaching watered down 
and its strictures set on one side and its clear position on these and other matters lead them to conclude that some of us are a bit wayward in our faith. And I want to call some of that criticism into question this morning. A key verse of Scripture referred to again and again in the discussion of these matters is in the book of Leviticus. If a man should lie with another man as he might with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. There. What could be clearer than that? Well, leaving aside the question of a literal use of the Bible, giving every verse an equivalent value with every other verse, let's look at the matter fairly and squarely once and for all. The words are clear. There is no doubt about that. But so too are the words that follow. Words that complete that verse. Words addressed on the same matter. Let me quote them too. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now nobody, nobody I've heard of, believes that this should happen. Of course they don't. That was what might have happened 3,000 years ago. It was a cultural matter. It all happened then according to the cultural norms of the time. And we've changed now. Things are different. Do you see what's happening in conducting an argument in this kind of way? Those who stick to the letter of the law when it comes to a condemnation of homosexual activity are quite happy to dismiss the literal value of the part of the very verse they turn to to prove their case that completes the argument of that verse. Now, isn't that odd? If you travel just a few verses further on in the book of Leviticus, incidentally, Leviticus is about the dullest book in the Bible, and um, I can recommend it for anybody with insomnia. <laughs> it gets odder still. In chapter 21, the very next chapter, you get a whole passage, a whole passage, telling us why nobody with a deformity or blemish should be allowed near the altar where God was worshipped. No one, no one that is, who is blind or lame or has a flat nose or anything superfluous, let the imagination run riot there, or a broken foot or hand or a hunchback or a dwarf, none of these can be allowed to officiate in the liturgical life of the community. Now, nobody, no liberal or conservative, no Catholic, nor Protestant, no traditionalist, nor progressive, would uphold any of those strictures against, in our contemporary world, against people with some uh, deformity or other. We know that that passage of Scripture is culturally conditioned and laid before us from an epoch in human history that is long gone. If you insist on the letter of the law, it seems to me that you should take the rough with the smooth and stick to the letter of the whole law and nothing but the whole law. You can't use the parts that suit you to buttress your own arguments or your own prejudices. I personally believe that the whole of Leviticus should be interpreted through the lens of culture. It was about a particular moment in a particular nation's history. And I have no problem in dealing with the injunction about a man lying with another man in precisely that way. Now, all of that occasioned by what I heard on the news, but it fits nicely with something that appears in the passage of Scripture that Joy read a moment ago. We're told in that magisterial piece of St. Paul's argument to the Corinthian church that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, the cornerstone of any preacher's argument. We don't stand here in our own right, commending things that are invented in our own head. We have been given to understand that a rift between humanity and God, a chasm that has opened up between God and those he created in his own image, has been bridged, glory, hallelujah. And it has been bridged by a God 
who is so concerned about the widening of the gap that he has given us a way back. And we see the way back in the life and the ministry of Christ. That's what the scripture says. Now, there are people who take that scripture in a different manner. And indeed, not just odd bods here and there. I would imagine there's one or two of them in Utah. There are certainly one or two of them in London. Let me tell you what they do. And it's summed up in one of the 39 articles of the Church of England. The 39 articles were an attempt by the Bible-loving part of what happened after the, Re the Reformation, who dismissed bishops because they weren't in the Bible, for example, who were the evangelical conservative body, and they put these articles together expecting the Catholic wing and to accept them so that Catholic and evangelical could together come into one church. So the 39 articles is a statement by the Bible core of people. And the second article of the 39 articles reads as follows, that we are to believe in one Christ, very God and very man, who truly suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried, to reconcile his Father to us and to be a sacrifice not only for original guilt but also for all actual sins of men. That the purpose of Christ's death is to reconcile an angry God with us, to tease a sulking God out of his corner, to bring a God who has every reason to bring thunder and clouds upon us back into a more harmonious state of mind. My friend, the Bible party in the 16th century turned Scripture on its head because it was God who took the initiative. He wasn't waiting to be one out of his corner at all. It was he who saw how wrong things had become and wanted as an act of pure, unconditional love to extend the hand of friendship and togetherness to bring a divided and separated and wayward humanity back into a path that might be wholesome and life-enhancing. The Bible party can be as guilty as anybody of turning the scriptures inside out when it suits them. And that has to be said. Scripture is clear. The reconciling God expects us, invites us to be reconciled. It's an offer. It's a free offer. Look at Christ and you'll see all that you need to know of me who sent him to you. Me who am love, unconditional, immeasurable, unfathomable love. I'm reaching out to you, my friends. It's not too late. Look at the one I've sent. See in him all that you need for your salvation. I plead with you. This is not a God who's angry in his corner. This is a God who's upset at losing us and wants to find us again and us to find him. Well, that passage has been very important in my life. It was in that passage that the scripture that the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and Americas found its watchword, the love of Christ constrains or compels us. The fuel in our motor is not anger or venom or hatred or spite or, vi or bile. The fuel in our tanks is love. It's love that keeps us on the go, that keeps us on the TV that keeps us looking towards others who are in the shadows or in bad places or in need of a welcoming hand. And love in the Caribbean for me is how I found my way back into a deeper faith. As Caribbean people, simple, illiterate, Caribbean people, peasant people living hand-to-mouth lives, showed me a depth to their understanding of being loved 
Imagine it, the poorest people on the face of the planet, les miséreux de la terre, as a French anthropologist called them, the wretched of the earth. Imagine them having in them a sense of their being gods that were so strongly implanted that hurricanes, earthquakes, civil revolutions could not drive that conviction out of them. They hadn't been pampered by the kind of history we've had. They hadn't been spoiled and besotted with all the material goods that we take for granted. They had only their faith to rely on. Only what was inside them to keep them aware of their humanity. They knew they were loved, and they helped me to know that I was too. Helped me to accept that offer of love that God holds out to us. And there must be something strange about people who want to pervert and subvert the meaning of Scripture in order to keep that promise away from people. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And he has not held our misdeeds against us. Goodness me, as I've done my pastoral ministry down the years in this church and others, in this country and others, I've met impeccable people who've got stained pasts. I've got wonderful front of house people who've got closed closets with all kinds of skeletons in them. I've met people who've done wretched things to other people, murderers, thieves. And all the time, my heart groans for them that they can't discover what it means to put their trust in a God who does not hold our misdeeds against us, but offers us a way to be liberated from all that holds us back, all that colors our past, all that we are wretched about or impervious to. And he engages us in this ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors, members from Utah. Ambassadors. Ambassadors in the diplomatic world represent their country as faithfully as they can. You see the ambassador, the high commissioner, the diplomat, and you see the country and the values that they espouse. So when a president of the United States, I was paused when I said that, sends an ambassador to the court of St. James in London, you would expect that the ambassador to the court of St. James in London will somehow be a perfect representation of the president that sent him. Uh, I, I don't uh, intend any notes of irony in that at all, of course. <laughs> I thought you'd need to be reassured on that point. So ambassadors present to the world an embodiment of the values with which they are filled. Give to others who meet them a sense of where they're coming from and who is sending them. Ambassadors are people who carry messages from the one on high to say to a lost world, you need not go on like this, getting into cul-de-sacs, getting lost. There is a way back and we have found it Give me your hand and I'll take you there too. So we are to be ambassadors. I said that when we went to the Caribbean and found this verse at the very heart of the Caribbean church's teaching, that it allowed me to, to broaden my understanding of this reconciling God who didn't only want people from Burryport in Carmarthenshire in his church on high. No, not even from Wales that I love so much and who provided all the core elements in a lion's test draw yesterday to the British and Irish lion. No, not even to the United Kingdom, divided as it is this, at this moment politically, socially, and all the rest of it. Not even to white people, not even to European people. No, this message was given to everybody and being in Haiti, was what made me aware of the breadth of the offer. And coming to Wesley's Chapel with members drawn from 55 nations, 
broadened it yet again. But it was when my son got us invited to a rock concert that I realized that I still hadn't reached the true breadth of the offer and the need that was out there. A rock concert? Me? Well, it's like this. Our oldest son, Tim, has as his best pal a lad called Chris. And Chris is the son of John Entwistle, now dead, but the bass guitarist for the group called The Who. And so, Chris had given Tim some tickets for the rock concert in Hyde Park. The only time I'd been to Hyde Park was to speak at Speaker's Corner. And I didn't have a microphone. You should have seen the banks of amplification that were there for this concert. Goodness me, you could have buried people alive in it. So off we went to hear the Who. And, uh, well, I'd been attending the Methodist Conference. It was the last day of the conference. We motored down the M6 at a hectic speed, surprised not to be caught for speeding, because we didn't dare be late. But like Wesley's Chapel, it didn't matter if you were late. <laughs> and in we came for the great concert. It was loud. But what the Who did was they put on a performance of something called quadrophenia. Now, quadrophenia is something they'd only done 20 years previously. They'd not done much with it since. And it's the story of a young lad who's got not schizophrenia, but schizophrenia times two. Circumstances have been such in that poor kid's life that he's a split personality, not just in two, but in four, quadrophenia. And uh, the rehearsal of all the things that leave the poor boy on the scrap heap um, is given through the performance. And in the end, the boy on a desert island is alone, and it's raining, and it's bleak. And the song with which it all ends is, all I really want is to belong, he cries out before singing, or Pete Townsend sang, love rain. Love rain on me. Love rain, spelt R-E-I-G-N. Love rain. Let love rain in the heart of the one who feels as dejected and rejected as that boy in that performance was made out to be. Let love rain. Rain. And the odd thing was that I had motored down from Blackpool for the conference, the Methodist conference full of Methodist people doing Methodist things. But ending that conference with the words of Charles Wesley where he announces that we, we believers are as far from danger as from fear while love, almighty love, is near. Love rain on me. And the offer of love is not made just even to believing people, but to be people outside the pale, in the crossroads of life, caught up in their drugs and their music and their this is and their that. And it is our job, people of the household of faith, to recognize our responsibility in letting that message run loose through us, into the community at large. So then, to sum up, my friends, know that you are loved by a God who reaches out to you in Christ. Accept that you are loved by a God who recognizes and affirms your worth. Sign up for the life of love, bringing hope and light and life in the place of despair and darkness and death. And do it now, today. Today is the acceptable day of the Lord. You, my friends, have received the grace of God. Do not let it go for nothing. God help us, my friends more than you think, depends upon our ability to follow that road. Amen.
we have a gospel to proclaim. 418. In respect of themes for our prayers of intercession, it is worth uh, pointing out that we are drawing near to the end of the Methodist Church year, and therefore a number of friends dear to us are on the move. So let us then take first place in our intercessions. Then the fire in Grenfell Tower, responsible for the deaths of at least 80 people, an inevitably huge upheaval in the lives of the survivors, that deserves to stay in our thoughts and prayers. As we have heard, today's scripture reading reminds us that Christ has given us the Ministry of Reconciliation. And it is good to reflect on the work of the Islington Faith Forum in which Jennifer has a leadership role. Then the presence of the Utah uh, ambassadors emphasizes the place of music in worship. And finally, a space to remember our own family members and friends. Let there be silences when we can ponder these matters and then as I say, Lord, hear us. Please respond, Lord, 
graciously hear us. Lord, hear us. Now we shall pray. Blessed Lord, as we remember before you those who are on the move at this time of the year, and especially Leslie and Margaret as they move into retirement at Croydon, reflecting on the innumerable blessings which this church has experienced from their shared ministry. And for Kidos, Sing He and Haim off to Barkingside, leaving us so grateful for all that they have contributed by way of music and enriching the lives especially of young adults. And for Jennifer Smith with her husband moving here from Ealing to take up her ministry at Wes's Chapel. Lord, hear us. Gracious God, as the Grenfell Tower disaster was responsible for so much suffering in terms of lives lost, of many families utterly disrupted, and of homes completely destroyed, we continue to pray for the survivors for the courage and determination simply to carry on living. But we pray too for those who are investigating the cause of the fire. And there are the practical needs of the people who remain, that they may have hope that there is a quality of life which they can look forward to. We pray for social workers and for members of voluntary agencies who can offer time and energy, patience and love. Lord, hear us. Dear God, as we have been reminded of the need to practice the ministry of reconciliation, we give thanks for the Islington Faiths Forum and the opportunities to learn and to offer friendship for the sake of enhancing the life of the communities to which we belong. And let us not forget that as a group of Muslim worshippers walked home from the last Ramadan prayers of the day, that one man was killed and ten people were injured. Lord, hear us. Lord God, we give thanks for the place which hymns and other kinds of music occupy in our worship. We praise you for the growth and development of our church choir and the effort involved in that. Likewise, for the skills and the cooperation of our instrumentalists and the atmosphere conducive for worship which we experience. But this morning we especially pray for the Utah ambassadors of music and what they have offered this morning. May they travel safely on their journeys in the UK and eventually homewards.
Lord, hear us. Finally, we make space to identify members of our families and friends that whatever their needs or opportunities may be, that your blessing, Lord, may be upon them and that they may find ways of living life to the full. Lord, hear us. And so we conclude our prayers with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So now we shall listen to our choir again, not only our choir, but their instrumentalists, as they render to us, Come, thou fount of every blessing.
Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And so we make our offerings to God now as the stewards wait upon us. Visitors, please bear with us while we have some of our local domestic announcements. Uh, first of all, a welcome to all those who arrived after the first welcome, and for, to four people who did arrive on time, but whose presence I did not acknowledge. So a welcome to Rachel Newton, with us from Bristol, uh, Vaseva Ngarao, uh, Jan Beebe, back with us, I think, for the first time since her husband's passing. 
and Hilary Armstrong. A welcome to all of you. Then Window on Wesley's, our church magazine for July. The copies are in the usual place on the table in the Radnor Room. Please take yours if you have not done so already. There are several meetings after the service today. Uh, Creche leaders meeting in the Quanglim Room. The Wesley's Chapel Ghanaian Fellowship meeting for rehearsals in the creche as usual. And they remind you that it's their Thanksgiving on the 23rd of July and you are all welcome. There will be special refreshments on that day. That's two weeks hence. And the finance trustees will be meeting, I think, in Leslie's office, if that's okay. Yes. So three meetings, three different locations. And a reminder for next week after the service that there is safeguarding training for those of you who have signed up. For those of you who are visiting and are able to stay and have a tour of the premises, uh, there are tours for the house, the museum, and the chapel itself. Your guide for today is Paul, and Paul will stand up so that you can see him. There he is. And please meet Paul at the front of the church after the service, because he is your passport to getting to the front of the tea and coffee queue. Um, tomorrow evening, there is a meeting of the chapel committee at 7 o'clock in the Quanglim Room. Please, all of you who are involved, uh, I hope to see you there, or if not you, somebody whom you have sent as a substitute from your work or organization. There are blue prayer slips in the service orders. Please fill them in if you have a prayer request and hand them in to one of us or put them at the back of the church. Uh, there are refreshments next door for everyone, those who can stay. And then with those who have ears to hear, let me repeat that, for those of you who have ears to hear, if you need to see me in connection with the 6th of August, please do so after the service at the office. I hope that isn't too cryptic. <laughs> and so we sing our final hymn, 350. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship. 300.
news for all throughout the earth, the gospel of a Saviour's name. We sing his glory, tell his worth. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us, with those whom we love and those whom we ought to love, this day and forevermore. Amen.